time together, right? Yes. Um, yeah, so it's, it's great to be able to develop some consistency and hopefully whenever you can join, we'll be seeing you. So I'll get started because we have only an hour together. So I'll share my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Thank you. So welcome, everyone. Today, we're looking at some strategies to promote meaningful, motivating, and communicative um, English language classrooms. And um, because there's so much information at this topic, I decided to make today's presentation part one. And um, stay tuned for part two. Um, and you don't have to have attended part one to come to part two. So tell your colleagues also that they can come to part two um, if they miss part one. Uh, as Andrew said, my name is Cynthia Robertson and I'm here working in Ghana as an English language fellow. And I have the privilege to work with some amazing teachers um, at the College of Education and also to meet people that are working in the secondary, junior high school and primary levels. So um, thank you for making me feel at home here in Ghana. I'm very, um, you know, after two months now, I'm feeling very welcomed and I feel like I'm able to um, <clears throat> take part in Ghanaian culture and to feel a part of what's going on here. Um, to Today we're looking at uh, three words. That look like in the EL classroom, and we'll be we'll be speaking today about the communicative language teaching approach. But I just want to say, and I'll say more than once, that it's just one of many different approaches that can make a communicative language classroom. We'll be looking at specific strategies for. Um, creating that. The three today that we'll look at are activating the schema, the quick write, and mentor texts. So hiding behind the word motivation is what is known as learner investment. And the researchers came up with the term investment, specifically Bonnie Norton, in the late 90s, and she's continuing her research in the 2000s. Um, and she says that investment is a better term than motivation because it demonstrates the complex relationship between learners and identity and the learner's commitment to the second language and to the acquisition process. And she says also that learners might be highly motivated to learn, but they're not invested in the learning environment, that being the classroom or that being where the English is being taught, right? So, that's also a very interesting thing to identify as part of motivation. Um, let's see here. When learners invest in L2, they do so anticipating that they will acquire a wide range of symbolic and material sources, which in turn will enhance their concept of themselves and their desires for the future. Symbolic and material resources. In other words, 
there's an investment going on. They come to your class and you expect them to learn, but the investment needs to come from them. And what they're going to get out of it for their lives and for the future is what investment is all about. What's in it for me? So investment is a complement to motivation, identity and commitment are not separate. An investment in the target language is an investment in the learner's identity. So they're, they're very much tied together. And in the research I did that came across the students accurately identified what that investment looks like for them, that they demonstrate that they have pride in their work. They increase their level of confidence as speakers and users of English. They feel a part of the, cl of the class and of any community where the English is being practiced. They experience the understanding of culture that's associated with that L2, and they understand that that language is useful to them, whether that means now or the future. And they also understand that it applies the ability to be creative, to have fun, and to use their imagination. So meaningful is, what does meaningful mean? Um, it means that it's relevant, it's authentic, it's personal. And the learner feels that what they say matters. What I say matters to me and matters to others. Communicative involves, you know, that personal part, that authentic part my voice, my identity is expressed, and it involves a lot of social interaction, which we've been talking about is one of the obstacles we face in classrooms that are very large, right? How do we break down a large classroom so that students can feel that their expression is personal, authentic, and that there's social interaction going on that is managed by you without being controlling? So how does the curriculum we are being asked to teach allow for that? This is the curriculum that we are handed by the school or the government, right? How does that allow us to, to teach in this way? And I think the answer is that it's up to us and it's in the lesson plan. It's in the way that we deliver the lesson plan because those things are not dictated to us. Um, they are, we have a syllabus, we have the curriculum, but how we deliver the lesson plan is the wonderful place where freedom is, right? The freedom to teach as we want, as, as we know, is a teaching approach that is effective to do the things we're talking about. So that's the teaching approach. And today I'm gonna to talk about one possible approach, which I'm sure that you are familiar with, communicative language teaching. But I really wanna emphasize that it's just a possible approach. There are many, and I use many approaches in my classroom. I don't just stick to one approach. I use many different approaches to create meaningful communicative lesson plans. But today I just wanna look at the elements of CLT because they're elements of every communicative approach. So this is what a classroom would look like that uses this approach. The learners are in continual interaction with one another, right? They're, you're breaking it down into pair work and you're using groups. 
And the lesson plan allows learners an opportunity to communicate something that's meaningful to them. So how you go about using your text and using the curriculum and choosing a lesson plan that's going to feel personal and meaningful to the learner is really the heart of what we're talking about. The teacher provides the meaningful content And that is the motivation and investment, right? The teacher gives the learner a reason, a purpose to communicate. The skills are integrated. So, you know, listening, speaking, reading, writing, vocabulary, and grammar, all of those things are integrated into a unit. It's not about you know, oh, now we're going to do a grammar lesson. The grammar is integrated into the speaking and the writing, um, and they're not taught as separate unrelated skills. So what do you all think the ratio of teacher to student talk time should be? Differ from the reality, right? Well, that ratio should be 30% the teacher and 70% the learner. So that's where we have to aim for, seeing that our classrooms are places where I only talk 30% of the time. It's a communicative language classroom is a place where learners are allowed to make mistakes because we learn from the mistakes, right? We learn by making mistakes. We don't make corrections. We learn sometimes from the corrections, right? We learn sometimes from the corrections, but we have to be careful about when and how we correct students. And that is also, as I said before, I mean, that is that entire hour's work of uh, worth of information um, where we look at specifically how do we correct um, our learners. For example, last night and the learner will repeat, yeah, I go last night. Perceive. Repeat the mistake. Important here conveying to you or even if they say I go, that they got many things. So everyone i think we lost um cindy she'll be joining shortly whilst we wait for her to join kindly put your comment can you hear me now yes welcome back we can hi cindy we can hear you i'm sorry is action unstable internet yeah but we can hear you okay and finally um we want to yeah and so that you do this in your classrooms but i can't stress enough the importance of the positive reinforcement um briefly telling students that they gave a great answer, not ignoring their answer, but telling them you have to think of different to respond and give that encouragement. And you're not giving encouragement to them if they have a wrong answer, right? Learners need to know that a wrong answer is wrong, but you do it kindly. 
accept the fact that sometimes they'll be right and will be wrong. And communicative language teacher is moving through the classroom, of course, the teacher becomes less and less central to the lesson and the learners with each other. The teacher is just guiding from the sidelines, right? Guiding from the sidelines while the lesson is unfolding and the learners are getting more and more power um, with one another. So the next part of our work here is to look at what that communicative lesson plan can look like. What does the lesson plan actually look like? And today, that's what we're going to talk about, looking at first, looking at how we present new material. How do we start a unit? How do we start a lesson plan, even if it's not the beginning of a unit? And the first step in that process is to make sure that we activate the schema. We want to activate the schema for our learners. And I don't like the term activate the schema because it seems so, so odd to me. Um, but that's what it's called. It's called the schema. And we're going to look at what that means. And I'm assuming that you already know some of this, so, but I'm just going to go through it to remind us all that this is what activity schema The schema is the building block of our lesson. You know, um, a learner needs building blocks. They need to start from a point that will be accessible to them. Schema is a way that we organize information in our heads. It's a file folder for our brains. So we've got in our brains all these files of previous information, right? It's all previous information that I, the learner, bring in. So schema is the background knowledge that we already have. And that's what allows us to comprehend, learn, and remember the new material that you're about to present to them. They're using what they already know to prepare their brains for the new material that you are about to present. And that makes them feel safe and ready to begin with the new material that you're gonna present. And some of the methods for introducing the schema, activating the schema, include things like visual materials such as photographs, maybe a graffiti piece of artwork, um, some kind of object, it can include written words, text reading, include a poem. It might include some visual maps. It might include an oral material, you know, like a news item or some story that you have to tell them or a speech that someone made. It might be a song, a music, a song, a piece of music, a song that brings out this um this schema this background knowledge you know the song is chosen to be your lesson plan a very specific song matches what you're trying to get across as would all of these things right they're integrated into whatever it is you're going to be teaching okay so we're now So you need paper and a writing implement like a pencil. 
And I want to invite you to look at these two pictures. of rivers. One river looks different from the other river. So you have two different kinds of rivers. And so right now, I want to invite you to these five questions. I want you to think of a river that you know. Think about where the river is. What is the river like? And what is your personal connection to the river? And then any other associations that you have with this river could be things that you did when you were growing up, right? Associations that you have with this river. And right now, we're going to do the first strategy, the quick write, which is a chance for writers to write down without thinking about grammar, without thinking about form, without thinking about being corrected. Okay, just giving the learners a chance to be with their thoughts uninterrupted for five minutes. So right now, yeah, you decide on the learners what the time frame is, five to 10 minutes. It depends on the level of your learners and what they're capable of doing. Uh, the first time that you do it, you might want to start on the lower side, you know, until they get used to it. So, so here are the five prompts, and I'm going to leave them up for you, and I'm going to start the clock and give us five minutes to write together about the river that we're thinking about. Okay, so enjoy that writing time for about five minutes.
some people are <clears throat> coming in perhaps late and seeing that uh, they have no sound, but in actuality, you have sound. We're just quietly writing now. So look at the screen and begin to write in your notes um, some of the thing, the answers to the five questions that you see here. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to ask you to please stop. Stop writing for now. And I would, in the classroom that I was teaching this, ask the learners to turn to the person next to them and share their rivers with each other. Okay, to tell about your river. And I would ask the students. So listen carefully to the end for yourself, whether you want to begin with a pair and then move to the four, you know, where one person could then introduce what their partner to them. So, of course, there are a lot of ways to deep Online here, what I'm going to ask I have a couple of people who would like to unmute themselves and to just share the elements of their river out loud for two people to share. Who would like to begin? If you could use the hand, the raise hand feature so I could see to share aspects about their river now. So how about Doreen? The river I would like to talk about is the Oti River, located in Kachakrachi in the Oti region. It's people fish from it. And I visited the river with my family when I was very young. And strangely, the river and the region bear the same name, Oti River, Oti region. Thank you. Oh, interesting, okay. All right, Doreen, thank you so much. And the next person that I'd like to ask to share is Sedu. Sedu, you need to unmute before you share, don't forget. Sedu, can you, can you unmute and share what you have? We're not hearing you. Um, I think you're still muted. 
would, mm, would someone else like to share? Perhaps oh, Sedu is not able hello. to right now. Hello. Oh, Sedu, hello, please go ahead and share. Thank you. Yes. Uh -huh. the, the river, yeah, the river I want to talk about is uh, um, the river water. The black water. It is um, a river that is situated in Daboya, um, in the northern part of Ghana. The um, river has been there for long. We used to uh, the water for household use and we also river. So it is also used for as transportation, connecting the um, part of the northern region to the Daboya Township. So this, this is what I can share about the river in Daboya, the water, black water. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Doreen and Salamatu. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. Up with those two shares, even though there's another hand up, we're going to go forward with another step. Um, and so you see that the learners are sharing something that's personal. They have personal experience with it. And therefore, it's easy to talk about, all right? And it's meaningful to them because we all have memories growing up of being, you know, our memories would make that personal for us. So, um, so there we have our rivers and Right now, I want you to listen to a reading. Um, and in listening to this activity, I want you to listen and to afterwards write in the chat room, what is the reader talking about, all right? So you simply listen and enjoy the words. And at the end, we will write in the chat room and try to wait until the end, right? So don't, don't write in the chat room while we're listening, but when the listening is over, let's write in the chat room, what is the reader talking about? All right, so. Um, let's see. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans. And I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Okay, in the chat room, let's write down what we think this reading is about. The program tonight will actually be in two parts. After we hear from Mr. People are writing in the chat room. Let's see. Are people writing in the chat room what the reading was about? Ah. Oh. What is the reading about? Um, hmm.
great. It is about rivers in Africa and how we bathe in the, how he bathes in them. The reading was about many rivers. Great. Any other ideas? He was talking about the usefulness of rivers. Their uses, great. Ah, he mentioned the Mississippi River and the different rivers he had seen in his lifetime. The pollution of rivers in Africa, hmm. Okay, wonderful. So you are constructing, you had a listening comprehension activity related to the reading, but you were prepared to listen for it through the schema of the personal rib, river story, the quick write, the pictures, the graphs, you were invited to remember about your own river before this difficult poem, this challenging reading, right? It was a, it's a challenging reading for some learners. So how do you approach it? How do you activate the schema? That's what we're looking at. So we're gonna keep, oh, and a couple more comments. Seeing resentment for slavery, wow. That is an advanced English language classroom <laughs> where we know about metaphor and we know about, um, yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Rita. Okay, and the, yes, there, and the, the depth of this poem is, is so wonderful. So let's now go back to our share here for a second. Okay, additionally, if we want to go a little further with this, we might choose to do a map activity with our learners, like activate the schema through a map activity. And I chose these three maps because these three maps are the ones where the rivers are mentioned, the Fertile Crescent, the Mississippi, and the African rivers. So you can create an interesting uh, pair activity with the learners using these maps. Uh, you could give them blank maps and ask them to label the rivers. You decide based on what you think your learners already know. And, you know, it's not a geography class, but you're activating the schema for this reading. And following the map activity, you might ask your readers to listen again to the reading. Listen now again to the reading. And this time, I want you to try what are the names of the rivers that you hear. So you see that after the map activity, the learners have a different additional information and activated memory of the rivers to be able to comprehend the listening activity where the Euphrates was mentioned, the Mississippi was mentioned, right? The learners might already know these rivers, but listening and hearing and understanding them by the speaker, that is a different thing. And so your map activity is again not about teaching geography it's about activating the schema so that now with the with the new listening activity the second time they'll be able to write down the names of the rivers so um the next step would be to activate the schema using a reading uh for a reading activity 
and going to now uh, have us do uh, an example with this photograph. So, so here is uh, the man who wrote the poem. His name is Langston Hughes. And here is a photograph uh, of Langston Hughes as a young man, uh, possibly, you know, in his home. So I want you to take a few minutes right now in the chat room to write down everything that you know about Langston Hughes based on what you see in this photo. All right, imagine that your learners, they don't know who Langston Hughes is, they've never heard of him before. And you are gonna ask them to look at this photograph and determine what it is they know about him from the photograph. So take a few minutes now in the chat room and write down in the chat room what you think you know about him. What do we know about him from the um, from the photograph here? Um, very simple ideas. You're just asking your learners to observe the photograph and to, yes, thank you. He is black. Uh, secondly, uh, he is an educated African man. And I'm just gonna let the learn, I'm just gonna let you all write some more ideas down. You think he's a poet? He is a poet. Oh, what do we learn from the picture? Ah. You learn from the photograph that he loves art, all right? And that he sure. is admiring something in the house. He loves art. And um, I would then ask, what type of art do you think that he loves? What type of art? All right. So great. So he is, he is tall in statue. He's giant in statue. He's got a large, you think that he's tall. And great. All of these comments are accepted, right? Because you're just observing. They know you. They do not, who he, where he lives. They're only trying to look at the picture and learn about this man. He is a black Negro, yeah. So I keep seeing that um, my internet is unstable. Are you able to follow what I'm saying? Can, you, can someone tell me if they're able to follow what I'm saying? I keep seeing comments about the in, unstable internet. Let's see here. Uh, you can understand me then. Okay. All right. So again, you're asking your learners to look at the photograph and to write down what they see. And then you're going to ask them to share with their partner that list, right? What do you um, tell your partner what you see in that photo? Okay. So then you're activating the schema through the visual. Uh, photo. And then what we would do is 
um, uh, another idea was to, to work in pairs to create that. Before that they do it by themselves, you might just ask them to do it together in pairs. All right, and so you're, you're simply asking them to write down what they observed. And then you have them listen. I'm sorry, they're, you're gonna have them read the text, but they've got additional information. Know that he, he somehow has a connection to Africa. They know he's a black man and that, and they know that he likes art. Um, and with that knowledge, now you're going to give them this poem. So, um, so here's the poem in its entirety. In their hands here off and on, but we're going to have a lot here. And so I'm just gonna have time for a lot of comments. So here is the poem. I hope you're taking a moment now to read it to yourself. It's a reading activity, so I'm gonna ask you to read it, not to read it out loud. In the classroom, if you're doing a reading activity, the learners can just read it first without having to read it out loud. Because reading out loud, you know, it's complicated, right? All right, then can I ask someone to, um, to now read it out loud? Ellen. Ellen, are you unmuted? Yes, please. Okay, go ahead and read us the, the reading. All right, so it says, I know, I've known rivers. I've known rivers, ancient as a world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Ephrates when downs were young. I built my heart near the Congo and it lured, it lured me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Ab Lincoln went down to New Orleans. And I've seen its moody bosom Turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much for reading that. I love the sound of your voice reading this. Um, so, um, finally, what we would do now um, is we would, we're looking at a mentor text as our final uh, strategy today, the mentor text. Um, and I would introduce a couple questions like, what does Langston Hughes mean when he says, I've known rivers? What adjectives does he use to describe the river? And what is his personal connection to the rivers? And we would take some time to unpack these three questions in class. And then what I'd like you to do now that we've talked about the poem, imagine I'm moving forward a little bit because of our time, but I would ask the learners to really look at those questions here and to look at what adjectives are used to describe the river, right? And um, and what kind of connection does he have? So what I'm gonna ask you to do 
is to go back to your quick write and add some things to your quick write about the river. Can you add any additional descriptions of the river? Um, he provides some color, you know, golden in the sunset. He talked about how it was muddy. The Mississippi is a very muddy river. Um, so I would have learners spend some time with the adjectives and then go to their own quick write. And now I'm, I, would give, I would give you five more minutes to add these ideas to your quick write. And then the final of this mentor text is I would spend some time learners how to do this. But for you, I would say just looking at this, you're going to use lines one. Um, the very first three lines are not numbered. You're going to copy those down. They're, gonna, they're going to become part of your poem. So everyone is going to begin with, I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world than the flow of human blood. Grown deep like the rivers. You will all begin your poem that way. And then you will write new lines for lines one, two, three, four, and five. And then you can repeat the last three lines. I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. Um, you could also have your students change the words ancient and dusky and add other adjectives for that second to the last line. But this is how they can focus on five lines, use their own personal river as their story and create a reading that evokes the same kind of ideas of a personal connection to the river that Langston Hughes has spoken of. So we've looked at activating the schema to engage the learners, how to use the quick write as a tool to engage them personally, and how to use the mentor texts. So right now, I want to spend the last minutes together um, sharing um, what you think about how to use this in your classrooms. So Doreen, do you have your hand up or is that a hand from before? I'm not sure. And Alan also. Any questions or comments? I guess what I want to ask you is, do you think that the visuals and also writing about your own personal river, did that connect you more to this poem than if you had just said to the students, today we're going to read this poem and I want you to read it out loud as step number one. That do you see that there is a difference between connecting the learners first to, uh, to what they're going to uh, see? Please feel that you can ask, uh, say it out loud here on this format. We're, Unlike the other webinars where we just had a webinar and then you went, we have, a, we have a couple of minutes that we can spend just listening to you 
comment about how it made you feel to write about your own experience with your river when you were when you were younger. So just to kind of summarize, you know, it's the way that we create a lesson plan using the curriculum that's going to motivate our learners, right? Um, Salamatu wants me to share the poem again. I'll be happy to um, go back and share. It's called growth. And those are too important you know, to, to find it on your own. So we don't have to go through each word in the poem and break it down and talk about the meaning. We can simply understand that this poet had a connection to the river and that you're learning of a connection to a river too. And that's gonna motivate them to even go back to this poem. You might have a learner come up to you and say, did he really build a hut near the Congo? Right? And oh, metaphor. You know, you're, you're, you're creating a place where your learners can get, right, about the words mean. But first, they have to care. First, they have to care. And our job is to make them feel like it has a purpose, right? And that is the hard work of a teacher. That is the hard work to connect them somehow. You know, here you have a textbook and you have a reading. How can you make it interesting and engaging for the learner? That's always our question. So, I'll be happy to take any other comments and turn it over to the embassy if you would like as well. But that, those are some of the ideas. And the next time I thought that we would some time to continue this of motivating, engaging and learners to communicate to one another things that are meaningful to them. And we would do a part two session with some examples that were like the part like the quick write and um, and the mentor texts. Okay, so thank you, Cindy, for that presentation. I believe it's it's been an eye opener for me, and I hope it's been so for the participants as well, giving new ways to perceive and look at things and how to express them, and add a personal attached to it. it. It becomes more meaningful, not detached from, from the learners or from me. And I say thank you so much for sharing with us. And we hope to um, continue on the part two of this of this series. For yes, the, I hope so. And to our participants, we say thank you for making time. And so we come your way next time. Um, it's bye from us. Keep an eye out on our Facebook and other social media pages. And also for those on the WhatsApp platform, please um, you be updated as to when the next event will, will, will be, and then you can sign up and join accordingly. And we also urge you to spread the word amongst your colleagues who you think will find this interesting, so they can also be part of the learning process. So thank you so much.
till next time it's bye from us